This is a Ramana Maharshi self-knowledge satsang. The focus is on self-knowledge, since self-knowledge is what brings self-realization, the deep experiential knowledge of your own existence. So, know yourself and be always free and at peace. Welcome. I'm Richard Clark, hosting this satsang. I've followed Ramana Maharshi since 1990. I took satsang for many years from one of the finest teachers of Ramana, Nomi at Sat in Santa Cruz, California. I've offered this kind of satsang for more than 10 years, first in India and now in Mexico. I am a seeker just like you, sharing what I love. I have been blessed with years of deep teaching and practice. In this satsang, I'll tell you about Ramana Maharshi. I will use many photos that Carol and I took while in India. These are in color. There are old photos too, black and white. I will trace his life from birth in a small town in South India to his remainder of his life in Arunachala and his Maha Samadhi in 1950. Now, Ramana was born December 30th in 1879 in Tiruchuli, a small town about 30 kilometers south of the ancient heart of Tamil Nadu, Madurai. He was born into a devout Brahmin family and given the name Minkata Raman. His father was a lawyer and his mother a homemaker. As a young boy, Venkata Raman was not interested in formal education. Rather, he enjoyed sports and spent most of his time with his friends. Bhumaneswara Temple is where he and his friends would go to play in this temple. They'd play hide and seek among all the stone statues. In India, there were no public areas other than temples. So these temples were used for family outings and picnics and as a play area for the children. Then Kataraman's father passed away when he was 12 years old. After the death of his father, he and his elder brother moved to their parental uncle's house in Madurai. Here is the house. It was in the center of town, a half a block away from Manakshi Temple, the main temple in Madurai. Manakshi Temple is more than 2,000 years old. It was home to the Sangam, a college of poets. Also 2,000 years ago, imagine that, a college of poets. This is the room of Ramana's self-realization. His self-realization came when he was only 16 years old. One day in July of 1896, while sitting alone in the house, he had an exceptional feeling of death, even though he was healthy. His upper body, hands and limbs went numb and still. He did not try to call for help. Instead, he let this feeling encapsulate himself, and he said to himself, yes, death has come. 
I am going to die. But what is the meaning of death? My whole body is becoming still. Is this death? My body is now insensible and still. Yes, I am dead. My body can now be moved to the cremation ground and will be burnt into ashes. As my body burns and turn into ashes, will I die too? Am I this body? Is my real self this body? I am different from this insensible and dead body of mine. I is an eternal divine light that lives inside my body and let the body function. The physical body is dead, but even this death cannot kill the I that lived inside this body all the while, because I is indestructible and eternal. All this was not dull thought, it flashed through me vividly as living truth, which I perceived directly, almost without thought process. I was something very real, the only real thing about my present state. Later on, Sri Ramana Maharshi recalled this incident and said, since this experience of death, I had no interest in studies at all. I felt distance from my old loved ones. I would open and hold a book as if I'm reading it, but immerse myself in thoughts of God. I noticed that the sense of peace, equality, and reverence started growing in me day after day. I spent most of my time meditating. Sometime my brother who noticed me meditating would make fun of me. I ate any food that was given to me. The taste of food did not matter to me anymore. In the past, I went to the temple for leisure, but then on, I started going to the temple with more awareness and spirituality. I did not know much about what life really was. Neither did I know what was Brahman or worldliness. However, gradually this incident helped me to think deeper about spirituality, God, the universe, and the self. His brother told him that if he was going to act like this, he should just go live with the sadhus, Indian holy men. Ramana agreed inside himself, and a few days later left his home and family leaving a note that was signed this. Imagine getting a going away letter from your 16 year old son signed this. Ramana took money intended for his brother's school fees, departed his home and walked to the railroad station. He got a ticket for what he thought was the closest station to Tiruvannamali, the location of his destination, the ancient mountain Aranachala, which he felt drew him to it. His ticket was to Villapuram, about 35 miles from Tiruvannamali. When he got there, he set out walking. After about 20 miles, he came to this place, an ancient temple, a Ranalur temple, a Shida temple. 
He asked for food and to stay the night and was re refused. Before he left, he sat down and started meditating. And the temple was filled with light. The same thing had happened here more than a thousand years ago when a Tamil saint, Sambanar, sat in this same place. Ramana got some food and a place to stay the night. He also found out that there would be a train to Tiruvannamalai the next day. He sold the only thing he had, a ruby earring, for money for the train. This photo is maybe what he saw out the window at the train in the distance. Aranachala, his destination. When he arrived, first he went to a tank outside the temple, Ayan Kulam tank. Before you enter a temple, you should bathe and be clean. Ramana did this and threw the rest of his money into the tank along with part of his clothes. He wouldn't need them anymore. He then entered the temple. It was most unusual. No one was there, and all the doors were open from the outside to the innermost door of the inner sanctum. Ramana entered the inner sanctum, prostrated himself, and said, Father, I am here. Now, Father is not a Hindu expression for God. Learn, Ramana learned this from a mission school while he was in Madurai. He later told his family that when he left, all the doors closed behind him. Ramana never talked about these things, these powers. In India, they're called cities. And Ramana always said that cities were for the ego. He wanted followers to pay attention to his teachings and not become fascinated by powers. For a period of weeks, he just sat and meditated. People saw the young Swami and brought him food. Other children, being children, tried to disturb the young Swami, throwing rocks at him and worse. To get away from this, Ramana found a shrine under the temple that was full of insects and spiders. The children were afraid of spiders so Ramana went down there and stayed for weeks. He stayed so long that when people came and removed him from the rocks, insects had burrowed into his legs. Ramana tried to find places where he would not be bothered. One place was about a mile away from the big temple. Guru Merton Temple. People discovered he was there, and soon many came to get spiritual benefits by feeding a Swami. So many came that they got into fights over being next in line. So Ramana left to a nearby mango orchard that had a fence around it and he would not be bothered. At this time, Palini Swami wanted, his attendant wanted to know more spiritually. So he went to the spiritual library at the big temple and found some books like Yoga Vashishta and Shankara's Press Jewel of Discrimination. He couldn't understand them and asked Ramana for help. This is how Ramana was first exposed to the classics of Advaita Vedanta. After he read them, 
he was amazed to find his experience described in books. Next, Ramana went to a small temple on a hill next to Aranachala, Pavalakandri. About this time, Ramana's mother found out where he was and went to bring him home. She found him at Pavala Kandra. Since he was still not talking, he wrote his response on a slip of paper. In accordance with the Parabdha karma of each, the one whose function it is to ordain makes each to act. What will not happen will never happen, whatever effort one may put forth. And what will happen will not fail to happen, however much one may seem seek to prevent it. This is certain. The part of wisdom, therefore, is to stay quiet. She returned home without her son. Ramana continued to try to find places where he would not be bothered. He stayed in different caves and shrines. One of these is pictured here, Guhai Namashavaya Temple. It was here that the dialogue that would become the book, Who Am I, happened. Ramana went further up the hill, Arunachala, finally to another ancient place, Virapaksha Cave. This photo is of Ramana sitting in front of the cave. He was to stay there from 1899 to 1916. During this time, he wrote the first of several devotional hymns, a marital garland of letters to be sung by his followers as they walked through the town asking for food donations. It has the refrain now well known. Aranachala Shiva, Aranachala Shiva, Aranachala Shiva, Aranachala. Aranachala Shiva, Aranachala Shiva, Aranachala Shiva, Aranachala. And verses like this. Aranachala, thou dost root out the ego of those who meditate on thee in the heart. O oh, Aranachala. Aranachala, thou dost root out the ego of those who dwell on their spiritual identity with thee, O oh, Aranachala. Now this is what the entrance to Virapaksha cave is like today. In 1912, Ramana had what is called the second death experience. He set out from Barapaksha Cave one morning for Pachaman Coil, accompanied by Paulina Swami and others. He had an oil bath there, and coming back, he neared Tortoise Rock. On the way back, when a sudden physical weakness overcame him, he described it fully afterwards. The landscape in front of me disappeared as a bright white curtain was drawn across my vision and shut it out. I could distinctly see the gradual process. On experiencing this, I stopped walking lest I should fall. When it cleared, I walked on. 
When darkness and faintness came over me a second time, I leaned against a rock till it cleared. The third time it happened, I felt safer to set, so I sat down near the rock. Then the bright white curtain completely shut off my vision. My head was swimming and my circulation and breathing stopped. The skin turned a livid blue. It was the regular death hue and it got darker and darker. Vasudeva Shastri, in fact, took me to be dead and held me in his arms and began to weep aloud and lament my death. My usual current of awareness still continued in that state also. I was not in the least afraid and felt no sadness at the condition of my body. I had sat down near the rock in my usual posture and closed my eyes and was not leaning against the rock. The body left without circulation or respiration still maintained that position. This state continued for some 10 or 15 minutes. Then a shock passed suddenly through the body and circulation revived with an enormous force and breathing also, and the body perspired from every pore. The color of life reappeared on my skin. I then opened my eyes and got up and said, let's go. In 1916, Ramana moved yet further up the mountain to Skandan Ashram, where there was water year round. Here, his mother joined him and started making meals, which have been offered freely to all who come ever since. This is still done today, more than 100 years later. He accepted his mother and became her spiritual teacher. As her death neared in 1922, after the violent gas began, Bhagavan placed his right hand on her heaving heart and the left one on her head. He looked at her intensely. The day passed that way. Subsequently, Bhagavan himself narrated what had happened like this. The latent tendencies and thoughts, which are the cause of future births, flared up. She had just then lost consciousness of the external world. Hence, in the subtle world, her subtle body was witnessing scene after scene of what was to happen. By this sequence of experiences, the soul went through the future birth and traveled towards the highest. Ramana declared that his mother realized the self at the time of death. So instead of cremation, she should be interred like an Indian saint. Per tradition, no burials were allowed on Aranachala. So they carried her body down the hill and buried it with appropriate ceremony and built a small shrine over the grave. Ramana moved from Skandan Ashram and stayed by his mother's samadhi. This was to become Raman Ashram. Ramana never left until his death in 1950. 
This is the old hall at Ramana Ashram. Ramana spent his days in here, sitting with visitors and answering their questions. Ramana said his highest teaching was silence. For those where this was not enough, he would sometimes answer questions. Many of these are found in books like Talks with Ramana Maharshi and Day by Day with Ramana Maharshi. In 1950, as death neared, thousands of visitors came each day. Ramana made sure he was available so all could see him. Here is Ramana on his deathbed. When tearful devotees express their sense of great loss, Ramana said, I am here. Where can I go? Upon his death, he was interred and a shrine built over his grave. This shrine is now the Samadhi Hall, and it's full of visitors every day now. Now on to our videos for this week. This video was made by a friend, and I made a small contribution in the photo. I got to know most people in the film called India. The South Indian town of Tiruvannamalai and its nearby mountain Arunachala have attracted saints and holy men for well over a thousand years. A hundred times older than the Himalayas, this mountain has been declared by Hindu scriptures to be a manifestation of Shiva himself. The Skanda Purana, a Hindu scripture, states that the hill came into being after Shiva took the form of an infinite column of light and then challenged two other gods, Brahma and Vishnu, to reach its top and bottom. Neither was successful. Shiva then condensed himself into the form of this mountain, allowing pilgrims to worship it. Today, it is one of the most sacred places in southern India. In 1896, a 16-year-old schoolboy walked out on his family 
and, driven by an inner compulsion, slowly made his way to Tiruvannamalai. Prior to his arrival, the young boy had attained enlightenment in his hometown of Madurai, located a few hundred kilometers south of Tiruvannamalai. A spontaneous inquiry into his real nature had resulted in the complete and permanent dissolution of his sense of being an individual person. It was replaced by a directly experienced knowledge that he was identical with an unmanifest substratum in which all the phenomena of the world appeared and disappeared. On his arrival to Tiruvannamalai, he threw away all his money and belongings and presented himself to the god in the temple. Afterwards, he remained in its precincts, abandoning himself to a recently discovered inner awareness of the divine that he felt to be the inner light of his own true being, a state that he later termed consciousness or the self. Ramana's experience and knowledge of who and what he truly was remained with him irrespective of whether his body was conscious, interacting with the world, or in a state of deep sleep. In Hindu culture, it could be said that he had realized the self, that is to say, he had realized by direct experience that nothing could exist apart from an indivisible and universal consciousness which is experienced in its unmanifest form as pure beingness or in Indian philosophy this is referred to as Mahat meaning awareness. In its manifest form it is the appearance and consciousness of the universe. Normally the full recognition of this awareness is known only through spiritual practice or grace after a long and arduous period of effort, but in his case it happened spontaneously, without prior effort or desire. Ramana became oblivious to the needs of his body, which wasted away as he was rarely conscious enough to eat or attend to its needs. Insects ate away his thighs, but the bliss of his inner experience was so intense he never noticed the disintegration of his body. After three years of living like this in various temples and shrines in Tiruvannamalai, he began a slow return to physical normality, a process that was not completed for several years. An ashram was eventually built around Sri Ramana by his devotees so that it could accommodate a constantly growing number of visitors. To this day, they come in their millions from all over the world. Sri Ramana spoke very little, preferring instead to communicate the essence of his state through silence. He knew from experience that if he simply remained absorbed in his own self, his own awareness, those in his proximity would, by a kind of osmosis, begin to experience that state for themselves. He was willing to give verbal answers to questions and hand out practical spiritual advice, but he considered these to be inferior and indirect forms of transmission. This silent flow of power represented his teachings in their most direct and concentrated form. The importance he attached to them is indicated by his occasional statements to the effect that his verbal teachings were only given out to those who were unable to understand his silence. 
To those who wanted a verbal presentation of his teachings, at the highest level that could be expressed in words, he would say that consciousness alone exists, not as an individual experience, but as an underlying substratum in which all beings and physical phenomena appear and disappear. If this was received with skepticism, he would say that awareness of this truth is obscured by the self-limiting ideas of the ego mind, and that if these ideas were abandoned, then the reality of consciousness would be revealed. Few of his questioners were able to discard their deeply conditioned experiences of themselves as individuals through explanations alone. When people complained that Sri Ramana's pronouncements did not correspond to their own experience of themselves, he would often prescribe a spiritual practice known as self-inquiry. He recommended this technique so often and so vigorously, it was regarded by many people as being the most distinctive feature of his teachings. He taught that the idea that one is a person who inhabits a body can be challenged and eliminated by focusing exclusively on the sense of I that registers and coordinates all our activities. When one thinks, I am angry, or I see a tree, or I am a lawyer, there is an I that believes it experiences all these things. Sri Ramana taught that this is an error that arises simply because we never look at or challenge the underlying I that has all these ideas. A vigilant focus on the I and not on the things it thinks about causes the sense of being a person to diminish and die, leaving a true knowledge of one's self. Abiding as what remains when the individual I has vanished is known as self-realization or liberation. Going against the established Hindu tradition, which promotes the idea that renunciation of one's family life is essential for those who want to progress spiritually, Sri Ramana taught that this method of self-inquiry could and should be practiced in the midst of one's ordinary, everyday life. He also advocated complete and unconditional surrender to the divine and said that these two methods, self-inquiry and self-surrender, were the only two effective methods for attaining liberation. In just the same way that we project a dream world at night, Sri Ramana taught that the world we see in front of us is merely a projection of the one who sees it. The projection manifests on the screen of consciousness, where we take it to be real, and imagine that we too are in this world, experiencing its dramas. In this self-created world, we are issued a script that determines our activities. We are unknowing actors in a drama who fail to realize we are just following an ordained script. We are unable to recognize that we are the screen on which the action unfolds and falsely believe that we are one of the characters. The source of the projection is the I that identifies with the body and then creates a false dream world to play and suffer in. Inquiry into the nature and origin of this I stops the projection and establishes one in the state where one knows oneself to be the indivisible consciousness in which all creation appears and disappears. This is liberation. And next we'll listen to a talk from Nomi. Nomi was my teacher for many years. Meditate along with him. He wants you to experience what he's talking about. Experience it, not just think about it.
Today is Guru Purnima. Yet the Purnam or perfection, the perfect fullness of the Guru, Sri Bhagavan, is always. Who is Sri Ramana? Silence is perhaps the most eloquent expression of that, the truth of the Maharshi. In order to know him as he is, why this is knowing God as God is, one must first relinquish any limitations on one's own vision. Approach as a body, one sees a body. Approach as an individual, one sees some other kind of individual. But he is not the body. And he transcends individuality or egoity entirely. The removal of one's own definition by virtue of inquiry into oneself or by deep devotion results in an absorption in the truth that he is. That is the truth of the self. The way to know what he is is to know your own being. Of course, is by his grace and his teachings put into practice, that is by self-inquiry and its result in self-knowledge, that you know yourself. If we approach as someone seeking the truth, then he is the guru that reveals the truth, a sadguru, a true guru that reveals the truth. If seeking that truth within ourselves, the form of the seeker is dissolved, what then remains? The greatness of that, the bliss of that, the truth of that cannot be conceived, much less described. From the position that is the imagined perspective of identifying oneself as an embodied individual, who he is, what that Brahman is, is difficult to grasp. If the I am the body conception is abandoned, and the ego is destroyed by seeking its source, by knowing its nature. Then the truth of Sri Ramana is self-evident. To whom is it self-evident? To him, of course. Because if this truth is realized, that is the truth of the self within you, if the self that he knows and declares himself to be is realized within yourself, there remains nothing to you but him, that, the one absolute. Again, as long as we think in terms of individuals, this would seem utterly impossible. Abandon the false ego notion by inquiry to see what it is. And what's being indicated is self-evident.
though he is the one by whose wisdom the truth is revealed and by whose grace everything is cared for. He is also that undivided, undifferentiated, birthless, imperishable existence, which is the only reality. To imagine yourself to be something other than that is a case of misidentification or ignorance the cause of bondage and its result in suffering. Meditating on the teaching he has imparted about knowing oneself, bondage proves to be an illusion, ignorance only imagination. The very seed or potential of suffering is done away with. and the ability to misidentify is utterly lost. So what can we say about the Maharshi, who he is? He is a jnani, a great sage. Yes, but more than that. He is a sadguru who liberates from the imagined bondage all who seek him. Yet he is more than that. He stands as that which transcends the three states of waking, dreaming, and sleep. That is, stands beyond the mind and the body and the senses and everything else including all the forms of this world. Yet he is something greater than that. He is that which is unborn and indestructible, the timeless, the spaceless. Yet even this does not adequately describe him. Consider this the next time you use his name, think about him, read a book about him, read something of his teachings. So who is Sri Ramana? You had best find that out within yourself. while inquiring within yourself to know yourself. Now we'll take a few minutes and meditate, inquire ourselves. First, notice that you exist. You exist and you know that you exist. And this knowledge is deeper than the senses or the mind. And following Ramana's instructions, inquire, where does this sense of I come from? Is it from the body? Does the body say I? You know your body. Does the body know you?
Is it from your senses? You know your senses. Are any of your senses you? How about the flow of breath and the flow of energy in your body, your beating heart? You know your breath. Does your breath know you? How about a thought? Does the sense of I come from a thought? Which thought is it that is you? If not an individual thought, maybe a cluster of thoughts working together is you. You know these thoughts. The thoughts have power only that you give them. So you're not a thought. How about the intellect, which weaves all these thoughts into more substance, into a world, into your own ego view of yourself as an isolated and separate human being? You know these thoughts too without your knowing them, they have no power. So if you're not your body, not the senses, not the life force, not a thought, or a set of thoughts, not the intellect, and not even the idea of the individual person, then just who are you? If it comes and goes, it can't be who you are. You are who you are always. Who am I? And we'll close with a short chant. Oh.